imagine you are sitting in a room. Your teachers are there, your parents, and your school principal. They are all talking about you. As they are talking, words like impaired, disability, can't, shouldn't, these words come up often. They are discussing what you need, and they come up with a plan for you. Now imagine that this happens every year. It doesn't matter what plan they come up with. They simply tell you that this is what you need, and they implement that. I want you to take note of how you feel right now. This was my reality growing up. I am profoundly deaf in both ears. I can only hear sounds that are very low pitch and very loud, like a tuba if it's really close. I cannot hear spoken language. I don't even hear my own voice right now. And I only use lip reading and American Sign Language to communicate. So every year, my teachers and my parents would have a meeting to come up with a plan for my education. This plan usually included things like wearing my hearing aids in school, being able to ask for test instructions to be repeated, or being able to sit front and center of every class, regardless of any seating choice. At the beginning of every meeting, my principal would introduce me and would explain that I am hearing impaired and that the purpose of this meeting was to determine how best to accommodate that. One year, as this meeting was coming to an end, a teacher turned to me and said, what do you think? And I surprised everyone by saying that it actually helps if I'm able to pick my own seat. Sitting right in the center isn't always best if a teacher tends to, say, always stand to the left of the classroom. So it's silent for a moment before someone said, that's actually a very good point. And that was immediately added to my plan. Now, this is one of the first times when I really started to realize I have a voice. Now, around the same time, I started a grade where we, as students, were allowed to pick which elective classes we wanted for the school year. So at the end of this meeting, they brought out a course description book and then tried to help me decide which classes I'd be interested in. I don't know why, but as I read through that list, one of them jumped out at me. Band class. <laughs> I had no idea how to play any instruments, but it just sounded interesting to me. The reaction that I got, though, was almost one of, oh, honey, are you sure? <laughs> now, my personality is one where if you try to tell me that I can't do something, I will go out of my way to prove you wrong. And that is exactly what happened here. I was adamant that I would take band class and that I would play saxophone. <laughs> so my parents got me a saxophone to use and some practice books, and they signed me up for a few lessons so that I wouldn't show up to the first day of school with my saxophone backwards or something else embarrassing. And I was so determined to prove everybody wrong that I showed up to that first lesson with half of that passage book memorized. I read that book cover to cover. I may not have understood all of it, but I read it. I studied all the diagrams. I practiced for hours and hours. And I apologized to my parents for that. <laughs> now for me, Playing the saxophone came down to muscle memory a lot of the time. It was just a matter of playing a part over and over until it felt natural to me. Eventually, I figured out that by sitting in a really specific way, I could feel the vibrations of everything around me. By comparing the vibrations out of myself with, say, the person next to me, I could tell if I was out of tune or not keeping time correctly. Of course, there were times where I was frustrated and I thought about quitting. And I had one teacher who saw this in me and sat down to ask me what was wrong. 
After explaining how I felt, he gave me some tips on practicing a really difficult speech so that it would flow a lot smoother for me. At the end, he told me that he, as a teacher, is supposed to inspire his students every day. But at times when he was overwhelmed, he would think of how much I adapted that I would inspire him. Now this blew me away. I never in a million years expected something like that or expected that I could be one to inspire others. I wasn't even going out of my way to try, but by doing something that I became passionate about, that was what happened. His words had stayed with me. And the more I thought about it, the little things that I could do differently, the more I realized that I could apply that same mentality to other areas of my life, like those annual meetings before school. I started adding more and more input to those meetings. Eventually, I started leading them myself. And I would tell my teachers exactly what I needed from them instead of letting somebody else explain something that they don't really understand. With each year, I tried something new. And each time, I learned more about myself and what I really need. Using a note taker in class to fill in gaps of information or even getting a copy of my teacher's notes to follow along during class. Struggling with lip reading was a process all on its own that just evolved throughout high school. No matter how diligent a teacher may be, it is impossible to see the faces of every student in class. I would miss answers that were shouted out or key parts of class discussion. It started with reminders to my teachers at those annual meetings, and then more reminders after class when I confessed that I did not understand most of it, not due to the content that was being taught, but missing the words being said. Some teachers would devise a system with me, like a code way to be able to remind them if I was not understanding. Another teacher would give me a pile of markers at every class and told me to throw them at the whiteboard anytime she turned away from me. <laughs> that definitely worked. <laughs> Eventually, I became more and more comfortable speaking up during class instead of waiting until afterwards to say something. And this was a really big deal for me to overcome that sense of social anxiety that I had at the time. Halfway through my junior year, I requested a sign language interpreter. When this happened, my grades improved on average by 7% across all my classes. I suddenly had a whole new world open up to me where I could understand everything in real time. This was something that I had honestly never experienced before. I was then able to start college with the knowledge of exactly what works for me because I already did that trial and error part in high school. Now, if you had met me at the beginning of middle school and then again at the end of high school, you would not have recognized me. I discovered empowerment, confidence, self-advocacy. I discovered that I am not a hearing impaired person, but that I am a deaf person. There's a difference. By embracing that, I realized that there are no actual limits to what I can do. I just may do something differently. Now this changed my entire perspective. That one simple switch from hearing impaired to deaf it changed everything. It changed the way that I view myself. It changed the way that I interact with others. It even changed the way that I approach problems. Instead of limiting myself to a box and saying, these are the only solutions I am capable of trying, I could now take a step back and say, well, this is what everybody else is doing that is not working. What can I come up with using my specific skill set that is different than everything else? But why do I share this story with you? Why should it matter to you? I share my story because I am not the only person who has faced this kind of adversity. 
but I am not talking about deafness. I am talking about words. The words that we say to each other on a daily basis are so incredibly powerful, so much more than we tend to realize. Children especially are extremely susceptible to this. And it doesn't even have to be as obvious as the words, no, you can't do that. It can be a lot more subtle. Impaired, disability, shouldn't, over and over. This is the language that is being used. But what is the message behind that? Children may not understand the exact definition of some of these words, but the implication behind them is clear. I am a big believer that our children and their children, they are our futures. They are our legacy. What kind of legacy are we going to have? We have generations of children who grow up thinking that for one reason or another, they can't. Some of the most radical and innovative solutions to the world's problems did not come only from highly educated scientists. They came from people who were thinking outside the box, from those who were approaching problems differently, those who used their differences as their strengths instead of focusing on the things that could hold them back. We need a future of thinkers, believers, and of positivity. But that has to start somewhere. And it starts right here, right now. Each and every one of you has the power to make an impact on the future, to leave a legacy of empowerment, of inspiration. Just a few words, a few positive words can have a lasting impact on anyone, even long after you've forgotten your interaction with that person. So today, I would like to leave you with a challenge. I want you to picture what kind of legacy you would like to have. I want you to think about what kind of future you would like to see. And I challenge you to consider which words you will use to build that future. Thank you.